today's webinar. And we'll be going through uh, the unfortunate events that took place on Valentine's Day in 2018 in Parkland, Florida at the Stoneman Douglas uh, High School. And you can see that I've got the agenda of the items that we'll be going through today. Uh, and uh, there will be a time for questions and answers. And so feel free to drop any questions that you have uh, into the chat box. And uh, as we get towards the end, I'll make sure that I am addressing those questions along the way, you know, as uh, well. Uh, but my name is Barrett Kendrick. Uh, Defender School is uh, my company. I've been working in the personal defense and active shooter response space. Uh, I've been helping people out, you know, for the past uh, 14 years. Uh, but we uh, partner with everyone from just individuals and to schools and places of worship uh, and just other entities that have an interest in being better prepared to protect themselves for different types of uh, violence, including, you know, active uh, killer events. Uh, but I thank you for everybody that is joining in today. I know that we uh, have some people on today's uh, webinar that uh, were with us last time when we went through the Uvalde shooting. So thank you all for coming back, as well as we've got some uh, new faces uh, coming in today as well. Uh, Stoneman Douglas High School is located in Broward County, Florida. Uh, Broward County uh, ultimately uh, is uh, just under 2 million in population at the time of the shooting. I believe it's gone up since then. Uh, but it is the uh, sixth largest uh, school district uh, in the entire country. So a very large school district, but, but it's the second largest school district uh, in the state of Florida itself. Uh, the uh, school had about 3,300 students at the time of the shooting in 2018. Uh, not sure what it sits at today. Uh, there's uh, several buildings uh, that span over the 45 acres uh, that the uh, school sits on. Uh, but the building where uh, the shooting took place was in Building 12. And Building 12 is a three-story building. It was built in 2009. Uh, it has uh, not your typical concrete structure that some of the older school buildings were, but this is more of a you know, stud and sheetrock style uh, building. Uh, but there's uh, 30 classrooms. And there's several other rooms uh, that is span over the three floors. Uh, and uh, that day, there were roughly 800 uh, students in the building uh, and uh, 30 teachers uh, that were in the building on that day. Um, we can't change anything that happened, you know, in the past uh, when we look at these types of events. And that's unfortunate, right? We can't go back and change anything. Uh, but I do believe that it's important that we, you know, learn uh, from these lessons and figure out, you know, how to be better prepared in the future. You know, I would like active shooter events or even violence or death to go away tomorrow. But unfortunately, in our society, that is something that we're dealing with right now. And so I think it is important that we, you know, look at these events to go back and figure out you know, what are the lessons learned and, and how can we apply those lessons? And, and the lessons that we find, you know, in this uh, school shooting, they took place in a school, but they can be applied to all types of facilities or entities or you know, even lessons that we can apply, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives uh, as well. You know, the you know, FBI has warned us in the past not to provide any notoriety you know, to the shooters. Uh, and so I'm going to do my best not to mention this shooter's name. And it's a hard rule that I try to live by is let me not mention his name, but let's stick with the names of the victims. Let's stick with the names of the heroes. And so we'll kind of talk about, you know, that today. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the shooter did, he put out a video or he didn't put out the video, but it was found on his cell phone in the aftermath. And it's just, it's a chilling video to listen to, to see what his mind was like prior to going into this event. Uh, but part of that, you could tell, is he was seeking the fame. You know, he, he wanted the notoriety. He wanted the fame. He wanted the payback against the, the people that did not like him or that he did not fit in with in school. 
And so that's something that comes up time and time again is the notoriety. So it's important that we don't provide him you know, with the notoriety. And so you won't hear me mention his name, uh, but he will be referred to as the killer or the shooter uh, throughout. I typically uh, know uh, a good bit of information you know, about these events prior to doing the webinars. But even just leading up to the webinars, I, I likely spend 10 to 12 hours, if not greater, of researching all the videos, all the reports, you know, all of the news stories to be able to bring you a, a, a very good picture of what this looks like and what the lessons could be learned from it. Uh, and I do my best, you know, to be accurate throughout the webinar, but just due to the unfortunate chaos of these types of events, and we also have to understand that there are different discrepancies that always could come up. Uh, but a lot of the information that we'll be talking about uh, did come from the official reports. Uh, there's been uh, two official reports that have come out from the state of Florida on this event. Uh, and there's been uh, several laws that have been changed uh, as well. Uh, that are mentioned in uh, the second report. Uh, these are the 17 uh, victims that were killed on that uh, horrific day in Parkland, Florida of 2018. Uh, there were 17 killed that include teachers as well as students, uh, and there were uh, another 17 uh, that were uh, injured uh, that day uh, as well. You know, uh, I'm going to go through a couple of fundamental definitions, and if you were on the uh, previous webinar, uh, you, you've seen these before, but I do think it's important that everybody understands uh, exactly what we're talking about. You know, when uh, you pay attention to the news, to the media, uh, you'll see that there's hundreds of events of what people call a mass killing or a mass shooting uh, type event you know, each year, hundreds each year. Uh, but the FBI carves out the active shooter type events from that number. Uh, and uh, when we talk about an active shooter event, we're talking about one or more individuals that's actively engaged in attempting to kill or killing people in a populated area. Uh, the, this is targeted in the sense of trying to drive up a death count. You know, this is very different than... Uh, gang violence at a nightclub at three o'clock in the morning where a fight breaks out and somebody starts shooting at the other person and maybe unintentionally hits several other victims. You know, in these types of events, we're talking about somebody that lacks remorse, that plans usually for a good amount of time uh, to intentionally drive up the body count. Uh, and that was mentioned in the shooter's videos uh, to himself uh, is that he, he talked about a number in that video. Uh, he shot more people uh, than the number that he talked about, uh, and it was uh, roughly equal to what he ended up killing. Uh, but these are people that, that they don't value uh, the life of another human being. But when you see the active aspect of an active killer or an active shooter type event, that means that it's ongoing, and by nature of it being ongoing, that means that there's opportunities to be able to stop it, to disrupt it, to interrupt it. I talked about uh, before, you know, law enforcement response to uh, one of these types of events is very different than typically the way that they respond, you know, to a domestic violence call on a Friday night at someone's house. You know, most of the time with uh, the standard operating procedures with law enforcement, the officer safety is is really high and the and the, the safety of the officers, other officers are also really high. But anytime you have an active killer event, uh, most modern policies dictate that the victims uh, uh, the victim survivability when it's active goes up and the the priority is on the victim and not the safety of the officer, which means that they you know, are to, to move forward and, and, and go into it to try to disrupt the killer. Now, uh, there's tons of lessons that law enforcement has learned uh, through this shooting, uh, and that's not what we're talking about here today. You know, what we're talking about here today is more about the hardening of the facilities, uh, the policies of the facilities, uh, and how to be better prepared, you know, as uh, an entity 
and not you know uh, the response of actual law enforcement. Uh, but it is important to understand about that uh, the active side of it. Uh, this chart represents true active killer events that have taken place uh, since uh, Columbine, uh, moving into 2021. Uh, 2022 uh, is not on this. The FBI has not uh, um, has not released the official reports and the official data for 2022. But you can see the trend with the numbers is that you know while the numbers are low and comparable to other violent crime, there it, it is trending up. You know with that. So I think more now than ever, uh, it's important to be prepared to be able to deal with uh, this type of violence. Uh, killers spend time planning. I mentioned that a moment ago, is that you know this is not spur of the moment. It's not impulsive. They spend a lot of time planning, and the killer in the uh, Parkland, Florida school was not any different from that. There was a lot of events that, that led up uh, to it. Uh, he was a prior student of the school and knew a lot about the school and the day-to-day -day activities as well. Uh, but most active killers spend at least 30 days planning the attack, which means that they're able to capitalize on the vulnerabilities that they already have an understanding of at that point. Uh, they also have a tendency to leak information and tell other people. Uh, we'll find that as well. Uh, the FBI released a phase two uh, study a few years ago and found that 88% uh, of those active shooters uh, age 17 and younger leaked the intent to commit the violence. And that is something that we see here as well. Uh, a couple of details on the shooter himself. You know, as uh, mentioned, uh, he did leak some information that we'll go through. There were a lot of cues leading up to that type of event. Uh, but uh, he was adopted early, uh, near you know near birth. Uh, he was adopted by a family in the area of, of the school. Uh, his adopted father died uh, as he was younger in life. His adopted mother died in about two months before the actual shooting. Uh, he had a history of, of violent threats uh, in history uh, with uh, his mom. He threatened to kill her many times. He he wished that she would commit suicide. She confided that information in others. And that wasn't something that was just recent, but that was ongoing uh, over a series of years uh, leading up uh, to the shooting uh, itself. But in February of 2016, uh, he, he made a comment that he was going to get a gun. Uh, and uh, he when, when he turned 18, he was going to shoot up the school. And he did this on Instagram. So he took a picture of himself with a firearm, posted on Instagram, uh, and, and posted that, those words right there. I'm going to get this gun when I turn 18 and shoot up the school. And that was uh, roughly uh, two years uh, before the shooting itself. So at the very least, we know that he was already planning you know, two years out uh, from this event. Uh, that Instagram post uh, was reported to law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement investigated it, but it had already uh, had been uh, deleted by the time that law enforcement was able to uh, get a uh, hold of it or try to investigate it. Uh, so what they did uh, was uh, turn that information over to the school resource officer uh, at the uh, school uh, so that they would have the information of it, but it never went uh, any further forward uh, from that. Sometime during the 2016-2017 school year, uh, you had one of uh, the other students that had a lot of concerns about the killer, uh, and so much so that you know he uh, felt that it was uh, needed to be reported to administration. So they had just gone through some active shooter training as a student body. They had been watching videos. Uh, and he saw several of the cues that were mentioned in the videos, you know, about uh, the Parkland school shooter. So uh, he did, he doesn't know exactly when it was. There wasn't documented report of exactly when it was, but it was sometime during the 2016, 2017 uh, year uh, and likely, you know, sometime before Christmas, you know, of uh, that school year. Uh, but the student uh, stated that there was a law enforcement officer present uh, as well and another student present when they were reporting that information. 
I said the student said that the administration and the law enforcement officer weren't uh, particularly concerned about the information, uh, but uh, he reported uh, his thoughts and felt that there was uh, reasons to believe that he may, you know, uh, attack the school. Uh, the administration uh, asked that the reporting student uh, go uh, Google and research uh, autism. Uh, and they, you know, kind of sound like they were implying that this was not, you know, uh, his violent behavior as a school attacker, but more related it to uh, being uh, potentially autistic. Uh, but uh, that uh, information uh, did not uh, go any further than that. And they told the student, you know, don't worry about it because he's going to be leaving the school anyway. And uh, that I think this was a Friday, and that was the last day that the reporting student had ever seen the the school shooter again, at least until uh, the shooting ended up taking place. Uh, so he did uh, leave uh, the Stoneman Douglas School and and did end up in another school. And as mentioned, there was a second student that collaborated uh, this event to law enforcement uh, in the investigation after the shooting as well. Uh, the Uh, the uh, friend of uh, the uh, school shooter uh, back in uh, 2017, in September 2017, uh, reported uh, to local law enforcement uh, that, uh, that the school shooter had a lot of concerning behaviors. Uh, he was uh, hurting animals uh, at the time. Uh, he was... Uh, he had firearms, he was making threats, he was potentially suicidal, uh, and so this person had contacted uh, the local law enforcement as well as uh, contacted the FBI, you know, about uh, this information. Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, the FBI, and actually this is a second call into the FBI, uh, the first one uh, was uh, about uh, a comment on a YouTube page uh, that he talked about becoming a professional school shooter on the YouTube page. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the person who had that YouTube channel actually reported that information to the FBI as well. Uh, they investigated it uh, in the Mississippi field office in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and uh, found that they could not substantiate uh, who account, whose account it was on YouTube that made the comment, uh, but the account was under the school shooter's name. His first and last name was the account holder, uh, but unfortunately, since the FBI could not collaborate that, uh, it did end up not going anywhere outside of the FBI uh, database, and they closed that case in 2017 in October with no other investigative activity. Uh, but then later on, in January of 2018, it's the previous one I was just mentioning, uh, this was the uh, female friend of Cruz, uh, excuse me, the shooter. Uh, she had uh, concerns about him. So she is the one who contacted local law enforcement and then also called into the FBI. She's made statements about him harming himself and others. Uh, he had made references to ISIS. He had threatened his mother with a rifle. He had purchased several weapons. Uh, he wanted to kill people and was, was going to explode. So this is information that he's telling his friend. Uh, he had been mutilating small animals, uh, and the caller was concerned about the shooter, that he was going to shoot up a school. Like I said, so concerned that, that she was calling the different authorities and reporting this information. Now, remember, in, the, uh, in September of 2017, the FBI had already received one report about him. And this is January 2018, uh, just uh, over a month before the shooting took place. Uh, and the uh, shooter, uh, excuse me, the caller uh, said that uh, the shooter was 18 years old, but had the mental capacity of a 12 to 14 year old. She was very concerned and had contacted uh, the Parkland Police Department as well, but wanted someone to look into uh, this matter. So this is now two reports going into the FBI. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with this, uh, the 
FBI uh, found the previous report in the database, the call taker did. Uh, the call taker contacted her supervisor. Uh, the discussion with the supervisors not been laid out in the commission report. Uh, however, what we do know is they decided uh, to not go any further with that. So it was never reported to the local field agency in that area of Florida. And, uh, and, and the FBI, you know, has admitted dropping the ball on both of these uh, unfortunate uh, tips that they brought in or fortunate tips that they unfortunately did not move further with. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, forwarded, it was never forwarded to the local um, offices. Uh, the uh, FBI uh, closed that Guardian lead uh, as well uh, and never moved forward with it. Uh, this is uh, the layout of uh, the school campus, as well as a couple of items uh, that the shooter had with them on that day. Now, uh, the, I mentioned the shooter's mom had uh, died about two months earlier. Uh, and in that two-month time, he likely uh, was getting closer and closer to carrying out the events. Uh, and as mentioned, he did record uh, some videos of himself talking about what he was going to do uh, to the other kids. Uh, but he uh, took an Uber on uh, Valentine's Day, February 2018, uh, to the school. Now, the school is completely fenced in, uh, chain link fence all the way around. And if you uh, look at the uh, different red lines uh, in the uh, pedestrian markers around the campus, those are all pedestrian gates. Uh, and then the blue lines with the vehicle markers are vehicle gates. And uh, like a lot of schools, uh, they do things to completely secure the perimeters uh, to be able to choke down the access to single points of entry through the day. And uh, the Stoneman Douglas does that school as, does that at that school as well. But uh, during uh, the egress uh, coming and go times, all of the uh, gates on the west side of the campus are all fully open and unmanned. Uh, and the gates, or at least the pedestrian gates that you see on the left side of the east side of the campus, those stay locked. And so after uh, school starts, one of the security monitors or maintenance uh, employees goes around and locks all of those other gates. And then they get opened at different times, uh, maybe lunchtime or different uh, times that students may be leaving. But uh, when they get opened throughout the day, uh, no one is manning those gates. There's not any faculty presence to be able to uh, to supervise uh, the coming and goings uh, of pedestrians. And this wasn't any different this day. So uh, right uh, prior uh, to the shooter arriving on school property, uh, one of the school monitors did just that. He drove around on his golf cart and opened up the gates, uh, preparing for the ending of the school day that day. Uh, the arrow that is more horizontal pointing from right to left uh, is more of the path uh, that uh, the shooter took that day. And so he got out of the car. Uh, he took an Uber to the school property. Uh, he had a backpack. Uh, you can see uh, he had a load uh, bearing vest with him uh, and a, a rifle case. And so as he gets out of the uh, vehicle that day, uh, the uh, monitor, Andrew uh, Medina, uh, had uh, witnessed him getting out. And in the initial videos with law enforcement in the aftermath of the event, uh, Medina had told uh, detectives that he sh saw the shooter get out of the Uber with a large bag and make a beeline towards the freshman building, which is building 12 there. You can see it labeled right before it became a killing spree. But he said in the original investigation uh, on camera that uh, he recognized the shooter. He was wearing a backpack and carrying a duffel bag uh, as the troubled former student and immediately radioed another unarmed security monitor to keep the eyes open. Now, I will say that he has recanted this statement in later videos, but in the original videos in the aftermath of the shooting, he, he did say that he recognized the shooter 
and that he recognized the case being a, a rifle case at that time. And that would be the second line that is pointed up on the screen. Uh, he was on the golf cart. And so he uh, was perpendicular to the shoot students uh, or to the shooter's travel path. Now, as mentioned, uh, the shooter was a, a former student uh, at the school, but was not currently a student. Uh, but he was uh, disguised and he was wearing one of the uh, current school uniforms uh, as he got out of the Uber uh, and went towards uh, the uh, school building. Uh, the uh, monitor... Uh, had, as mentioned, he radioed to another unarmed school monitor who was uh, near or uh, just on the west side of uh, Building 12. Uh, but the initial uh, employee uh, had said that, I'm telling you, I knew who the kid was because we had a meeting about him last year. And they had said during that meeting, you know, if there's ever going to be someone to come to this school and shoot up the school, it's going to be that kid. And so that's who he said he had recognized at that time. Now, uh, the active shooter protocol uh, for that school would have dictated in witnessing that to initiate a code red response, which would have initiated the school lockdown. And so, uh, but he has, as mentioned, recanted that and said that he did not recognize it as a rifle bag or uh, as the troubled student that was no longer at the school. Uh, the uh, second monitor that day, it came in uh, to the left side of uh, building 12 uh, and ended up on the opposite sides of the hall uh, from him. And then the monitor saw him go into uh, the, uh, the uh, staircase on the east side of the building. I'll show you all a video of that here in a second. And then he ended up moving, uh, the second school monitor ended up moving towards the second floor. Now, he said through the investigation that he wanted to intercept the uh, shooter on the second floor, uh, but uh, the second uh, individual, the security monitor, ended up uh, and uh, locked himself into, I believe, a janitorial closet on the second floor, and he stayed inside of that closet throughout the entire time. Uh, the second monitor also uh, did not initiate uh, the code red uh, response uh, that likely should have been initiated based on his perception enough uh, to be able to go lock himself into uh, the closet. So both of them had radios, but neither one uh, moved forward uh, with the code red uh, response. Uh, the first code red response, by the way, was not called until three minutes into the shooting. And so the shooter uh, was inside of building 12 uh, for about six minutes and 40 seconds. Uh, and it was halfway through the shooting is where the first uh, code red call came. Uh, so these uh, next screen here, uh, this is going to be an animated layout of what took place uh, during uh, the shooting of this event. Uh, now you'll have green dots on the screen that represent uh, the students or faculty. Not all classrooms are, are going to be shown, you know, with uh, the, uh, the the people uh, that were in them that day, just the ones that ended up having some sort of casualty uh, in the rooms. Uh, yellow dots are going to be injuries, uh, and the ones that are kind of a, a light shade of blue going into gray, you know, are uh, deceased. They are all are, uh, the 17 uh, fatalities uh, that took place uh, here. So it's completely animated. You'll see the black dot is uh, going to be the shooter himself as his path that he goes through. Uh, so he starts off on the right side, which is going to be the east side of the building, and immediately goes into the stairwell. Uh, I'll probably fast forward at different times on some of this, uh, but we will go through uh, to be able to see uh, the path that he took uh, as he went through the building. Uh, the, the green dots coming on screen, as mentioned, those are representing uh, the humans uh, that are in the room. Uh, these three dots approaching are uh, going to be, maybe I won't be able to pause it. Uh, the three dots approaching are going to be uh, students walking toward the building. The black dot coming behind them is uh, going to be uh, the shooter himself. But right now, he does not have the gun out, but he goes into the stairwell. This is him coming into the stairwell, getting his firearm out. Uh, the second person coming in was actually a, 
uh, an acquaintance of uh, the shooter. Now, remember, the shooter's not a student anymore, but the acquaintance sees him loading the rifle, and uh, the shooter, uh, at that point, uh, after loading the rifle, uh, tells his friend uh, that uh, it's getting ready to get messy. You better get out of here. And so uh, I don't know that he was a friend, but he tells the acquaintance it's getting ready to be messy. So you don't you better get out of here. So the acquaintance runs out the door and runs away, you know, to go get help, uh, which was a, a third employee, uh, which I believe was the one who ended up calling the code red response uh, eventually when we came to investigate. But as he came out of the hallway, immediately the shooter uh, starts uh, shooting uh, the students in the hallway. You can see the blue dots that have already taken place. Uh, those uh, are uh, fatalities that have already happened uh, at this point. Uh, the uh, green dot all the way to the left in the hallway, uh, she ends up uh, getting shot in the legs and, uh, and is able to escape away out of the gunfire at this point. Uh, but as she's fleeing, she is shot. And then you can see, you know, ends up uh, ducking into that room at the, uh, the little corridor at that point. So he shoots uh, kids uh, in the classroom. Uh, the shooter never goes into the room. He only shoots, shoots at what he can see uh, from the outside of the classroom. So now uh, typical uh, school doors in the sense that they have... Uh, you know, solid doors uh, with the little panel windows on uh, the sides of the doors. Now, also, it's important to know that uh, with all of the locks on these doors, uh, you were forced to go outside to outside the room into the hallway to be able to lock this door with a key. Uh, if you had a quarter turn of the key, uh, then I believe the door stays locked. Uh, or would unlock when you un when you turn the key back. Uh, so it, it had multiple stages in the lock themselves, but they did have to go outside the room uh, to be able to actually lock it. Uh, but he stays in the hallway. This is still floor one that he is in. And so he moves around floor one. Uh, and as mentioned, you know, uh, does uh, stay in the hallways but just shoots people from the hallways into the rooms themselves. Let's see if I can fast forward this just a little bit. So uh, he goes from floor one, he comes back, shoots more people in classroom 1216, uh, and uh, then uh, ends up moving towards the west side of the building uh, and ends up going into uh, the second floor eventually. So you can see he did shoot people along the way, anybody that he ended up coming across. Uh, important note about the second floor is they heard the gunfire. And I'm going to play a video of what gunfire can sound like in a building, but they heard the gunfire. So the second floor, they turned off the lights. They did things to lock the doors, to, you know, to, uh, to hide in different corners of the room. So he thinks more or less nobody's home as he goes through the second floor. No one is shot on the second floor. But unfortunately, the third floor, uh, they do not hear the gunfire. Uh, and uh, what can happen with gunfire on the inside of the building is it stirs up a tremendous amount of dust. So especially like with the ceiling panels, that kind of stuff, they'll put off a tremendous amount of dust which have a tendency to uh, trigger smoke detectors or fire alarms. And, and so that ends up happening. So as uh, he is shooting on the first floor, it triggers the uh, fire alarm. Now, the fire alarm is connected through all the rooms, uh, all the floors, and all the buildings on the campus. So now the fire alarm is going off uh, in uh, all of the buildings You know, at this point. And so on the third floor, they don't hear the gunfire uh, or it's so muffled that they don't understand it to be gunfire. So they start responding like it's an actual fire alarm. Now, earlier initial reports, people did believe that there were uh, potentially the fire alarm pulled, but the investigation does not show that. Uh, it just shows that just the, uh, the smoke and just dust ended up setting that off. Uh, but he ends up going up the stairwell and as he's going up the stairwell, students start to realize that there is an active shooter. So they start fleeing back towards the classrooms. 
Uh, some people were able to get in the classrooms and get locked. Unfortunately, some people were crowded outside the rooms and they were not. And so he uh, was uh, able to attack and kill people that were in the hallway stacked up on top of one another, as well as uh, inside of the rooms. And so after uh, moving back and forth uh, through this third floor, you see you had a teacher that started to get people to get them to run. So they run down uh, and out of the room. Now, he does make an attempt to get back into that stairwell, uh, but he is successfully stopped by one of the students who literally did nothing more than put his foot in front of the door to prevent the door from opening. And so at that point, he goes into the teacher's lounge uh, that was from the third floor and attempts to shoot from the window at people down below. Uh, but with the heavy, uh, thick hurricane glass, uh, he was uh, prevented, you know, from being able to uh, to shoot outside the glass. And so the glass stopped it. Well, it's at that point that he ends up dropping his gun, ends up uh, dropping his gear and ends up fleeing uh, down the actual stairwell uh, as well. So you know, fast forward just a little bit more to get through that. So there's a picture of the glass uh, that he attempted to shoot through. So it was likely his plan was to shoot people as they were fleeing, uh, but thankfully un, uh, wasn't able to do so. And at that point, you know, he ends up uh, fleeing uh, down the stairwell uh, and again, he's in a school uniform and then runs out of the school and runs down the street. Now, he when he leaves down the street, he goes to Walmart, which is a couple of miles away, walks into a subway, buys a soda, stays there for a couple of minutes, uh, goes to McDonald's. Uh, in McDonald's, he attempted to actually get a ride somewhere from uh, someone that was a student at Stoneman Douglas. Uh, that student did not know of the shooting. He also did not know that his sister was one of the casualties uh, that uh, this uh, killer had just killed uh, that he was talking to uh, in McDonald's. Uh, but that's uh, that's the event. Now, there were several heroic actions that day. I think it's always important that we talk about you know, some of the heroes. Uh, Anthony Borges, uh, he was one that survived this encounter. Uh, but uh, Anthony was shot in both legs and his back while trying to close and lock a classroom door. Now, his friend said that nobody knew what to do. And, and this is why training is so important, is that you've got a bunch of people in a classroom. No one knew what to do. And so you had a lot of people just standing around doing nothing. And that's, that's shown in some of the videos, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, his friend said that that Anthony, uh, he took the initiative to save the other classmates. So Anthony went to the door. He went to lock the door. Uh, he was shot multiple times during that encounter, uh, protecting uh, the other people in there. Thankfully, uh, Anthony survived that encounter. Uh, Peter Wang did not, uh, but Peter Wang was shot multiple times as well while holding the door so his, his, his classmates could escape the gunfire. Uh, so he's definitely one of the heroes that day. Uh, the uh, coach, Aaron, uh, the coach, uh, he's one that had a history of, of putting himself second. This was not any different on this day. Uh, he jumped in between the gunfire and the students to put himself in between it. Uh, he pushed people out of the way uh, to be able to get out of the line of fire. And uh, he, he died this day, uh, and uh, they, they found uh, burns on his hands as well. So it looks like he also made an attempt uh, to stop the attack, is it, that he had must have grabbed hold of the rifle. Now, uh, grabbing hold of rifles and controlling guns is something that we cover in our training program, uh, but we also have to understand that you know different parts of the gun uh, can be extremely hot and cause burn, but it is something that could be, you know, fought through uh, as well. But uh, he unfortunately did end up getting shot uh, soon after uh, that encounter with him. Uh, Scott uh, Bagel. Uh, Scott, uh, he, this is someone who didn't have to, but he was in his locked classroom and there were students outside of his classroom. He did not have to, uh, but he opened his unlock, he opened his locked classroom to allow those students to flee, you know, back into the hall. 
and they made it in. And unfortunately, he gave up his life uh, to be able to save the lives of the uh, students uh, that went into the room that day. Uh, and so you know, Scott's definitely a hero. Uh, Meadow. Uh, Meadow is one of the students. Uh, she is, I believe, uh, was 14 years old. Uh, Meadow uh, was shot multiple times by the killer. Uh, but instead of trying to just save herself, you know, Meadow, is, she's one, she crawled to one of the other victims. She laid her body on top of one of the other victims to shield that victim from the gunfire. Uh, and, and she tried to play dead. Uh, but unfortunately, the shooter did end up killing them both. But I mean, it just, you know, very, very heroic actions taken by each of these people. And like I said, this is not, these weren't the only ones. There were, you know, multiple uh, others. Uh, but these are just one of the, uh, some of the few that I want to highlight during this encounter. Uh, let's go through, you know, some of the, the factual conclusions. You know, one is that uh, the event went on for six minutes, 40 seconds. There was a school resource officer that was there. Now, uh, his, uh, it's hard to say what his perception was, but he never went inside the building. He stayed outside of the building, uh, and uh, he even radioed to responding officers to stay at least 500 feet away from the building when uh, the shooting was still going on. Like I said, active shooter protocol says you've got to put yourself second and go towards the gunfire uh, to stop the killing. And the killing was definitely going on uh, while the calls were going out uh, and while the police were responding. Uh, but uh, even had the other officers immediately gone into the room or immediately gone in the building, it still likely would have been over you know, by the time that they were able to, uh, to intercept or to make contact with the shooter. Now, your school resource officer was the only exception uh, that would have taken place there, uh, but he was only in the building uh, just for a few minutes. Uh, I mentioned the code red alerts earlier. Uh, several staff members had opportunities uh, to initiate the code red response, uh, but it was three minutes into the shooting uh, or into the attack uh, before that first code red response uh, took place. Uh, and so, yes, uh, three minutes and 16 seconds after the shooting uh, first started. So first shots fired three minutes and 16 seconds is when uh, one of the other uh, faculty members, uh, monitor Elliot Bonner, uh, came across uh, one of the uh, fatalities. And that's when uh, he ended up calling that in. Uh, but the uh, monitor who went to the closet on the second floor had opportunities, as well as the one that was on the golf cart. Uh, so the code red uh, these are, you know, factual commit uh, conclusions from the uh, the code. Uh, I mean, from the commission report, that there were lots of opportunities, but unfortunately, the code red response was uh, took too long to initiate. Uh, and so, part of this is, you know, this this needs to be talked about in training. You know, one we we need to empower, you know, faculty and students to be able to raise the red flag and to you know to call in the emergency. Uh, but also, this needs to be drilled. This needs to be practiced. The, the, the simulations need to be put in place in training so that, that this is not the first time someone may be seeing this type of stuff. And it's not just conceptually being taught, uh, but they're having the opportunity to practice this you know, during the different simulations. Uh, this uh, video, I, I'm going to play, uh, I've edited out uh, any of uh, the victims, uh, the fatalities uh, that are part of this video. Those have been edited out. Uh, but something that I've seen come up time and time again uh, with active shootings that take place inside of a building are the muffled sounds of gunfire. And some, some of y'all uh, probably shoot guns, so you've been to a gun range. Some of you haven't. Gunfire on a gun range is loud. Gunfire inside of a building, especially inside of a classroom, inside of concrete buildings, can muffle those sounds tremendously. And I mentioned the first, the shooting on the first floor, there were lots of shots fired. But even uh, to the people standing outside of the building, they didn't know where the shots were coming from. To the people on the third floor, 
they didn't respond at all like there was gunfire taking place. But this is uh, just uh, two clips uh, from inside of classrooms. The first one's going to be a little bit louder, but still muffled. The second one's going to be even more muffled than that. Uh, I think it's important that uh, this is incorporated into training, is that teachers understand that gunfire is not going to sound like what you expect it to when you're inside of a building and there's several walls uh, or sound barriers that are in between. Now, this also does have the fire alarm uh, that's going off, uh, and you, as mentioned, will hear this, but I have edited out the graphic material. <laughs> I don't know if you could hear, you know, what the student was saying at the end, but he was, he was saying, do you think this is real? Is this real? Uh, and with those muffled sounds, you know, it's so easy to second guess ourselves because this is not a normal situation. And, and so we, as humans, we try to rationalize, there's no way that this could be a killer. And, and we try to rationalize what we're hearing, what we're seeing. And so it, it's important that this is being covered during training and prepping. And so that when your intuition is telling you to that this could be a bad situation, that you're also responding like this is a bad situation. Uh, but the gunfire, you can tell, is extremely muffled. Like I said, sometimes uh, it's, it's even more muffled than that, uh, where uh, you don't hear it at all. But I think you had one student who you know, questioned herself, but in one of the videos that she just kind of jokingly, and some of the students were kind of jokingly talking about it, but one of the students jokingly kind of hid in a cupboard, uh, thinking that, you know, there's no way that this is. And this also sounds very similar to construction noise outside, that kind of stuff. Uh, the uh, commission report, uh, it listed several pieces that, uh, that the commission, the state of Florida says, this needs to be done as a requirement moving forward. Uh, and uh, I'll cover each one of these. Uh, but it was very important that all staff uh, should have clearly established roles and responsibilities that are outlined in a written policy and procedural manual provided to all personnel and that uh, all security staff or safety teams should be uh, should regularly meet uh, and uh, train uh, protocols and procedures uh, in emergency situations. Now, let me sum this up a little bit, right? You've got to have the policies. Faculty has to be aware of the policies, but no one in an emergency is going to go read the policy. So uh, more important is the policy is established so that you can train to what the policy is and train to what the protocol is and go through the simulations uh, and and, and initiate uh, and be better prepared, you know, for uh, these uh, types of uh, situations. So it can't just be the policy. We got to be better prepared. It can't just be the dedicated security officers. It's got to be more than that. All faculty should be empowered to be able to do something, uh, even if their role is not the safety responder or security personnel. Uh, campus gates must remain closed and locked, and when open for an ingress or egress, they should be staffed to prevent unauthorized campus access. Uh, if uh, someone was there at the gates, then the potential to stop this incident uh, was, would have been a lot higher seeing this person on the front end. Uh, and so uh, Florida moving forward is making it very clear is that Florida schools, if they're going to unlock a gate or an ingress or egress location, that they have to have a faculty member there uh, to uh, be able to monitor the traffic coming in and out. Uh, doors leading to instructional classroom or student occupied spaces for ingress or egress to a campus uh, must remain locked during school hours. And if uh, they're open, they should be staffed. 
All teachers should be able to lock doors from within the classroom and keys should be on the person at all times. Uh, this is something that comes up time and time again. If your teachers have to leave the classroom to fumble for a lock and there's a killer, then the risk of casualties is going to go up a lot higher because it's going to slow the process down. The locks need to be modernized to be able to be in line with the fire marshal code, but also be uh, allowable, uh, allowing uh, with the teachers to be able to initiate a lockdown or the students to initiate that lockdown if needed to do so. The uh, code red policies. All schools should have a written ambiguous code red uh, policies, uh, the active shooter response policy. Uh, that is applicable to all personnel, parents, and students. Uh, it's got to make clear that all personnel are empowered to activate emergency active assailant response procedures and that those procedures are to be immediately implemented upon notification. I highlighted this a second ago. Everyone has to have the empowerment. You know, if we designate that it's only these three, four, five, or even a dozen teachers what happens when half of those are uh, not, you know, in the area or they're in the bathroom or they're homesick that day? Everyone should be empowered to be able to take steps to prevent violence. Every school must have an effective communication system through which everyone on campus can see and or hear and immediately react to a called code red or similar active assailant response notification. Uh, the school, uh, the Stoneman Douglas School had a PA system. The PA system required teachers uh, to uh, hit certain buttons on certain walls. At least one teacher refused to put herself in harm's way to be able to go across a classroom to do so. Additionally, the PA system uh, did not announce anything into the hallways or outside so there was no way of getting that information uh, into uh, the hallways themselves. Now, lots of schools are going to the app-based systems on the phones uh, to be able to allow students you know, and or faculty to initiate those types of uh, code red uh, protocols uh, moving forward as well. And that's certainly a great idea. But being able to get the information out faster uh, will uh, bring down the risk of uh, the casualties uh, during these types of events. People need to be able to respond, but they can't respond until after they have the information. Uh, classrooms uh, should establish uh, safety measures uh, such as hard corners or other safe areas, and teachers should have the ability to cover door windows quickly. This comes up time and time again. You know, we talk about in our training, you know, certain blind areas or hard corners of the room where somebody has to be in the room where they're able to see or realistically attack those corners. Uh, 30 classrooms at Stoneman Douglas, only two teachers had these corners previously established, and both of those classrooms had furniture blocking those hard corners uh, as well. So got to set them up, got to establish them. They need to train to them, uh, understand them, and also make sure they're available to be able to uh, get into in the event of a shooting taking place. Additionally, uh, teachers, in, and not just teachers, we're talking about schools, but really this applies to any building. You need to be able to lock the doors and cover the windows quickly. You've got to have something that can cover those windows very quickly. So if you can do blinds, that may be something you may have pull down shades, uh, but at the very least, you know, if you're a teacher watching this, there's, there's no reason why you don't have a piece of Velcro on the glass windows with a, a poster that's similar in size Velcroed to the wall next to it, where you could literally just easily grab that off and stick it on the glass uh, in the event uh, that you need to cover those windows. But in this case, the uh, shooter did not go into the classrooms. And so if the door was locked and he could see people, he could shoot through the glass. If it was open, he could shoot through uh, the doorway. Uh, another avenue is protecting the glass, is doing something, uh, putting some uh, of like the laminate security film on the glass that is capable of stopping certain uh, bullets, certain projectiles, certain calibers. Uh, we uh, have a good partner uh, in the industry that works with that. Uh, I work a lot around 
uh, firearm personal defense as well. And I'm telling you, I've been very impressed with that laminate film as well. So definitely reach out uh, if you'd like to get more information on securing those types of glass panels or glass partitions. Sc uh, schools should evaluate and give consideration to the appropriateness of locking bathroom doors. So here's the thing. Uh, the uh, Stoneman Douglas had an issue with vaping and I believe drug use in the bathrooms and the buildings. Uh, they don't have enough faculty to go around. Uh, so what they did is uh, they locked all the bathrooms on the first floor, all the bathrooms on the third floor, and put a school monitor on the second floor outside of the bathroom so that they could monitor what was happening in the bathrooms. Unfortunately, uh, that potentially led uh, to a fatality because there was uh, at least one student who would have been able to, uh, to get into the bathroom away from the shooter uh, and not be stuck in the hallway where he was, but she was prevented in doing so because of the uh, locked doors. All districts should establish a system to ensure compliance and accountability with these requirements and consequences for non-compliance. Florida, the state of Florida changed a lot of laws and making this, uh, making some of these pieces law. And, 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 and they, they're holding schools accountable for this. And whether you're in Florida or one of the other many states that, that people are watching from today, it's important uh, that, you know, that you're putting this in place, you know, with uh, any type of facility, really, but establishing, you know, those people who are in charge for making sure that protocols are established and that schools, teachers, and even the students are following those types of protocol and holding people accountable uh, when uh, required or when needed uh, to do so. Uh, this is a quote, you know, from uh, the commission report, and I think it it, it sums up a lot of this uh, as well. But you know, while the goal of school school security is to prevent another tragedy, the reality is that another school uh, assailant or active assailant event will occur, and the real questions are when, where, and what is the place uh, to quickly stop the attacker and to mitigate the harm. And I kind of talked about that in the beginning, right, is that unfortunately with society, the likelihood of an event uh, is that they're going to happen, uh, at least for now. And, and if it does happen, you know, are, are your, is your facility going to be prepared uh, to be able to initiate a response to these types of encounters? Everybody is caught off guard, you know, when this happens. I mean, this is a uh, a, you know, uh, Fort Lauderdale suburb, you know, down, you know, in Southern Florida, you know, beachy community uh, that uh, has a lot of happiness in that area with 30,000 people living in, in Parkland, Florida. They certainly didn't expect something like this to happen, but it does happen and it does happen in different places. And, and so we, if we can't prevent all of them, that needs to mean that we need to be better prepared to stop them when they happen and to keep them going on for longer because the faster they're stopped, then ultimately the casualty count drops uh, significantly with that. And so I think that you, know, that you should take a moment and think about the plans that you currently have and the policies that you currently have. Is it adequate? Is it enough? Are you providing the training necessary to faculty and students you know, to be able to respond, you know, to something like this. Uh, and are you equipped for that? You know, what needs to be put in place? Start to prioritize what needs to change and what needs, you know, ultimately to happen. Uh, medical training, you know, is a, another avenue of not just the response during the event, uh, but in the aftermath. Uh, law enforcement officers are trained to bypass the victims in order to stop the attack. You know, so your initial responders aren't there to provide medical aid, uh, but medical aid is a big part of it because if people don't die from the initial trauma, blood loss ends up being the next biggest killer. And so having the tools on hand uh, to be able to, you know, to be better prepared, having the knowledge, having the, the tools and the teachers and the staff or even students understanding things like bleeding control 
And to me, this, you know, this doesn't have to be about violence. This is just about everyday life skills. You know, automobile accidents happen. ATV accidents happen. Motorcycle accidents happen. Falls happen, right? And, and so I think that all we're really doing is empowering people to be better prepared for everyday life, but also in the event of a worst case active killer type situation, that the potential to save lives from those that are on hand is already there. But I, I can't highlight, you know, training enough with moving forward. Doesn't matter what event we look at, we find examples of victims there that that people just don't know what to do. They they freeze in the moment because they haven't had training or they haven't had realistic training. You know, or they haven't had proper training that properly prepared them adequately you know, for these type of active killer events. And so I can't highlight that enough in, in working with it is that, uh, is that, it's in, that you need to put the things in place to, be, uh, to prepare your staff and faculty with hardening the facility, but also with providing the training to be able to better respond to these types of events. Now, uh, with uh, these webinars, you know, I do always want to open up questions and answers, and so you're welcome as we're finalizing this. If you have a question that I haven't covered or you'd like me to more thoroughly cover that, feel free to drop it into the, the chat box you know, moving forward as well. Uh, I uh, have my contact information on the screen uh, with the QR code. Uh, if you point your smartphone camera at it, you can import all of my contact information in, uh, into your uh, phone as well uh, pretty quickly you know, with that. Uh, but uh, I want to challenge y'all. I want to challenge y'all to take a serious look at the policies and the plan that you currently have in place. You know, are you uh, doing an adequate job to best prepare those people that need preparing? And also uh, put an offer out there for you is that you know, if you want to have a 30-minute a call, uh, just a, a Q&A time, you know, with me uh, to talk about any of the policies or plan or facility or security measures or training uh, that you currently have or don't have, then I'm making myself available for that. And so shoot me an email, give me a call, you know, we'll schedule a, a 30 minute window, we can do zoom, we can do phone, whatever, we'll schedule that 30 minute window uh, to go back and forth and, and to discuss anything that, that you still have questions about uh, and moving forward with that. But I mentioned on previous webinars that I will continue to do these breakdowns uh, over uh, the, uh, over you know, really month to month. Uh, and, and so if there's uh, specific uh, incidents that you would like to see me break down and talk about further, uh, feel free to shoot that over in an email or a phone call, and it may be something that we can look at doing, uh, but I hope to have you on uh, the uh, future uh, events and working with it as well. Uh, moving forward, let's see, uh, do have one question on the uh, codes. Uh, do you recommend plain talk or schools using codes? Uh, I recommend codes, and this has come through really federal guidelines and studies. Oh, excuse me, I don't recommend codes. I recommend plain talk, and this is through uh, the studies uh, from different federal entities, uh, specifically FEMA, uh, that has found that uh, code words have a tendency to lead to more chaos and questions. Right? Instead of hearing code red, if students and faculty hear there is a shooter in building 12 on the first floor, then highly likely their response ends up having a lot more urgency. And so uh, a plain language in any type of emergency makes sense. Uh, and so I do recommend, you know, with that, you know, a lot of schools uh, use things like the school safety, uh, the standard protocol uh, in initiating lockdowns. And so if they're using uh, different words like lock in or lock down or code uh, red, then it needs to be followed by what the event is. So it's a code red event, code red event to grab the attention of those listeners, but then explaining that you know, we have a shooter in this building. This is what the shooter looks like. This is where the shooter is. Uh, and, you know, this is what you need to be doing. Uh, it's also important to always repeat 
any of those instructions as well. First one may grab the attention, but people may not understand that. So I definitely recommend uh, the uh, using plain language in those. All right, well, thank you all for jumping on. Uh, I, I hope to have another opportunity to talk with you. Uh, we uh, have a training program. Uh, I would love to tell you more about that training program and how we can help you better prepare for these types of events and just really uh, the everyday stuff. Uh, and so I uh, hope to see you on next month's event. I will send out an email to each and every one of you that are on, uh, as well as you'll have the opportunity to share this uh, video uh, with others who are not able to be a part of that. But I will see you next time on the lessons learned with our active shooter webinars.